within the next few seconds or so. So we'll just keep the recording on. Welcome to everybody. And, you know, let's get started. It's a couple of seconds early, but we won't cover too much substantive material in the next few minutes anyway. So welcome, everybody, to a brand new course. This is College Geometry. This, of course, is Stephen Haas. You may remember me from other classes. If you have me, if you haven't had me, well, welcome. Um, I am going to be covering an interesting class this time. We're going to be discussing geometry. Not that the other classes I teach are not interesting, but I've always found geometry the most interesting and, believe it or not, the most fun of all the math classes because it's so real life. It's not just an abstraction. Every problem is based on something that you could actually see in real life, uh, whether you're talking about figuring out how much fertilizer to, to buy to cover a backyard, whether you're figuring out how much wood to purchase in order to be able to build that birdhouse you're trying to build, or for many, many, many different types of scenarios. Uh, geometry is going to be relevant, and geometry is a challenge. Geometry, a lot of these questions that you've seen, if you haven't had a chance to look over the homework, that's perfectly okay. I'm not expecting you to have done the homeworks yet. I'm not expecting you to know how to do the homeworks yet. But if you do look at the homeworks, if you can go ahead and just look at them a little bit, a lot of these homeworks they're kind of like puzzles. There may not be a an immediate right answer that jumps out to you, but it's a kind of it's a process as much as an answer. Doing these questions is almost like first you got to figure out an attack plan, and then once you figure out an attack plan, well then you can go ahead and actually do it. Um, so you'll know, like number two. Well, number two, okay. Number two is also a little bit of problem solving. Yes, assignment number one is like that. And what we are going to do during this class, you may have noted. Hopefully, you saw the syllabus. If you didn't see the syllabus, I did recommend over here the Khan Academy page in geometry. Again, you don't have to watch the Khan Academy lectures in geometry. I think they will be very helpful, especially if there is something that you do not understand. I think you know. May, hopefully, I'll be able to explain it to you. And if I can't do it, hopefully Sal Khan will be able to explain it to you. And between the two of us, hopefully, we'll be we'll be all right. But the, I am going to be the course grader for this class. I am going to be the teacher for this class. This is a very small class. There are less than 20 students who are actually enrolled in the class. Uh, so I expect everybody to ask questions. If you have any questions, I expect everybody to participate in class to the extent that you can. If you can show up and if you can participate, that is fantastic. If you miss a class, obviously they will be recorded as always. But I really would appreciate it if you showed up to class if you can. And the reason is, believe me, I've taught other math classes and teaching, and teaching to an empty class in a math class just doesn't work out that well. It's very very hard to gauge feedback in terms of whether people are understa understanding what you're talking about. If there's nobody there giving feedback, well then I guess you just kind of have to assume that everybody knows what you're talking about and you just move on. Whereas if people are there to kind of give feedback and answer questions that I pose, I can tell whether I need to go over something or whether I need to elaborate on something a little bit more. There's a series of written lessons that are linked to from the slides and documents page. I don't know if you had a chance to see that. I just posted that today. So if you haven't looked at that, I did just post that today. Again, that's an extra resource. It's not mandatory. You don't have to read that, but hopefully it'll help. I think it'll help. I think it's a pretty good document. <laughs> okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. All right. So there are eight homework assignments for this class, and there are approximately one every two classes, approximately one per week. Uh, the, on the syllabus, it tells you which classes the each homework is based on. For example, assignment uh, homework number one, I mentioned after class two, you can start that. For example, it's down here over here. So assignment number one is after class two, so you can assume that this contains information from classes one and two. Then homework assignment two is after class four, so you can assume that that contains information from classes three and four, etc. There are two exams for the course. Uh, unlike the normal three. We're going to have a midterm exam, which is posted after class eight, and then there will be a final exam, which will be posted after class 15. We're not going to worry about the exams quite yet. Uh, let's worry about the material and then the homework, and then we'll worry about the exams later on in the course. Don't want you to have to worry about that yet. I've got certain procedures in terms of how to go about submitting your homework. The best thing you can do the best that I would do if I were taking this course and I was a student and I needed to do it, what I would do is I would print it out, <coughs> print it out, do it by hand, uh, scan it. 
if you have a scanner, hopefully most of you have access to a scanner, scan it as and convert it into PDF. There are some lessons over here about how to do that. If you're not sure how to do that, maybe ask me on the message board. I'm happy to show you all how to go about doing that. It's very easy. Convert your documents into a PDF and upload the PDF. That's the best way to do it. If you want to do it on your computer, if you want to do it on Microsoft Paint or something like that, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, if you're totally flummoxed and you have no idea how to turn it into a PDF, let me know but uh, hopefully you'll all be able to figure that out and if you don't again let me know and I'm happy to show you. Okay, um, now we're going to be covering lots of different facets of geometry. I do have a little bit of a cough so everyone once in a while you might actually hear the sound go blank for a couple of seconds. If that happens, it's because I muted it, because I needed to cough. Sometimes I won't actually get to mute it, and I'll actually cough. But you don't need to hear the sound of that, so I'm going to try to mute it if I get there on, if I get, if I get there on time. But of course, I make no guarantees. Okay, um, I am also the course grader which means I will be grading your, we don't have any other course grader who's going to be grading it. Whatever you send to me, whatever you upload, I will try to give you as much feedback as I can. If you get it right and your process is correct, well, then you don't really need feedback because you did it correctly. Uh, whereas if, you, if there was a mistake in your process, I will try to point it out. I'll try to give you homework and I'll try to give you feedback in terms of marking the paper itself. I also may try to give feedback and maybe in audio form as well if I feel that that is important for the particular scenario. So with that in mind, I am going to actually start the course. And there, right now, you may have noticed that there, until today, there were no slides up on the slides and documents page. I did post slides for chapters one and two, or for classes one and two, well, which also happen to be chapters one and two, uh, on the slides and documents page, and I am going to be using them in class. If you ask me why they were not posted before today, I will tell you that they didn't exist before today. Uh, I made up the first two today, and as we move along throughout the course, I am going to try to write slides for each individual class as we move along. Hopefully that will help. Again, not because I expect you to learn from the slides specifically, but as a little bit of a basis, kind of, uh, so that you can, when you review the slides, if you understand everything that's in the slides, it means you know this, you know the material pretty well. I am going to be using two sections of the uh, in the classroom over here. I am going to be using the slides, which are in the lower left-hand corner, and the whiteboard, which is over here. The whiteboard is where I can tell you things like hi, and I can also actually do problems. I will tell you, chapter number one does not have a tremendous amount of material today, so assuming we have time, and I assume we will, I want to go through chapter one relatively quickly, and then I want to move on to chapter two, because chapter two is a big one, and I want to spend probably about a class and a half or so on chapter two. In terms of the homeworks, there are, as you can see, each homework has you know, roughly between six and ten questions for the most part. Uh, some of the questions are pretty involved, some of the questions are much simpler. Uh, I am going to be going over a couple of the questions from each homework in class. So for example, if there are ten questions on the homework, I might do two of them in class to give you a little bit of a head start and to get you to understand how these homeworks go. But like I said before, if anybody has any questions at any point, please feel free to chime in. Chapter number one over here in our book, and what's scheduled for class one, is methods in problem solving. The reason why we've got a whole chapter on that, which seems kind of a bizarre way to start a math book, you know, when you start a math book, you should start uh, explaining, you know, what x is or how to multiply things and whatnot. Well, geometry is a little different than algebra. <laughs> Taking algebra, by the way. Have we had a few people here? Okay, so if you've taken algebra, so hopefully you should be have a little bit of a leg up because a lot of the stuff in geometry really builds on algebra. And if you haven't, by the way, I put in the syllabus links to some of the algebra classes that I strongly recommend that you go ahead and watch if you are unfamiliar with algebra. You don't have to be familiar with high-level algebra. The most advanced algebra that we're going to be using in this course is probably something like 
7th or 8th grade level. So we're not talking about particularly advanced algebra. The algebra that we're going to use in this class is not as difficult as the more complex algebra that we got to in the algebra course. In the algebra course we got to quadratic equations and solving systems of equations and all that. We're not going to get anywhere near that. The algebra that we need for this course is simply regular linear equations with one variable, very basic, basic stuff. But still, there is some algebra knowledge that you're going to, be, you're going to need. And so I strongly recommend that you watch probably the first four, maybe five classes of the algebra course if you're not familiar with it. Second of all, don't try to be a hero use a calculator. <laughs> there's nothing, there's no, no if, if you're doing an exam or doing a homework, you don't have to do things by hand. You can if you like, nothing wrong with it, but there's nothing wrong with using a calculator either. So, like I said before, when it came to algebra, things were pretty straightforward in terms of how to solve problems. There was a method. You took the problem, you isolated the variable, and away you go. Geometry is a little different because geometry sometimes you got to think a little bit outside the box. Somebody mentioned before that uh, that uh, question number two in the first homework. It's not a very difficult question if you know what to do. The problem is figuring out what to do. And so there are some methods that we are going to discuss over and over again throughout this course. And chapter one kind of gives you an overview, a synopsis of what these methods are. We're going to look at seven methods in problem solving. Now, that I'm not saying that you have to use one method for an individual problem. You may use three different methods or some sort of a combination of three different methods in a particular problem. And I'm not asking you to memorize these. I am not going to ask you on a test what is strategy three for, uh, for solving geometry problems. These are just things to kind of take with you and keep in the back of your mind as we move along. Number one, this is probably <coughs> the single most important thing you could do when you're dealing with a geometry problem, and that is draw a picture, draw a diagram when you're talking about geometry. If I tell you, for example, that we've got a baseball diamond, and the baseball diamond has 90 feet between bases, and it has 60 feet 6 inches to the pitcher's mound. And I ask you, how far is if the shortstop throws a ball to first base? How long is that? Well, yes, absolutely. You can definitely use uh, use additional papers as much as you like on an exam or on an assignment. That is absolutely fine. So the first thing you want to do in my example is to draw a diamond. Now, as you will find out. Throughout this course, I am not much of an artist. In fact, I am perhaps one of the worst artists you are ever going to see. Uh, okay, I'm not going to even try to draw a better diamond. Um, the, this is about as good a diamond as I can draw. So, if we have that example, if I say this is a baseball diamond, and I say there's 90 feet between bases, and the pitcher ma pitcher's mound is 60 feet 6 inches, let's say 60 feet six inches to home plate, and I ask you, you know, if a ball goes from the pitcher's mound to the, uh, you know, if I ask you, for example, if, I, if, if the, a ball goes from the pitcher's mound to the plate to shortstop to first base, how long does that travel? Well, if I try to do this in my head, it is going to be virtually impossible to do. The Drawing a picture and drawing a diagram and labeling the diagram with all the information that we have will be by far the best way to answer this kind of a question. By the time this course is over, this may look like, does this look like a, compl a, pl a complex question for, uh, well, shortstop usually stands a little bit further back, but let's assume the shortstop stands exactly, the infield is in, so the shortstop stands exactly in between second base and third base. Uh, so uh, d does this look like a complicated question? I will tell you right now that by the time this course is over, this will be a very easy question for you. You'll all be able to do the question. You'll be, you'll, you'll be able to do the question very simply. But in order to do the question, the first thing you have to do is draw this diagram. Believe me, if you try to do this in your head, it'll be much, much more difficult. So you figure out how far the first path is, and then how far the second path is, then how far the third path is, add them all together, and that's essentially what drawing a diagram is. In 
question number two in the homework, they actually do draw a diagram for you. Uh, but even if, if there were no diagram, you would, draw, you would draw one by yourself. OK. So that is drawing a picture relatively self-explanatory. It may be a, whoops, it may be a, a diamond like you see in front of you. It might be a circle. It might be <coughs> any kind of a geometric figure that you're going to have to deal with. Strategy number two, trial and error. That's not a very mathematical way of doing things. But let's say I told you that there was, you know these combination locks that some people have on their door? Instead of there being five numbers, let's say there were only two numbers. And you had to figure out how to get through that lock, how to get through that door. Well, what would you do if you had a little time on your hands? You would just keep trying. First you try one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then five. Remember, if there's only two numbers, so there's only 99, there's only really 100 possibilities, including double zero. So you try 100 times and see which one works. That's trial and error. That's not the ideal way to do things, but that is a way to do things. If you think about the entire idea of the scientific method, it's really kind of based on trial and error. We're trying to see whether a certain type of drug lowers cholesterol. Well, first you have some sort of a thesis as to why this drug will lower cholesterol. But then once you have this hypothesis, once you have this thesis as to why this drug will work, or you think that it will work for whatever reason, what do you do next when you're talking about the scientific method? You test. You experiment. You run some sort of a valid scientific experiment to make a determination as to whether this is going to work. If it doesn't work, well, back to the drawing board. Try something else. If it does work, test again. If you've gotten significant results in a significant period of time and you think that, and therefore that establishes that the result is correct, well, now you have an answer. Trial and error, although it's not very you know, sophisticated, it's not very mathematical, <coughs> it is something that can be used as part of a problem-solving attempt. Number three, and this is something that we are going to look at, that we are going to do throughout this course. This is probably the single most important type of strategy when you're dealing with geometry. And that is use a variable. Using a variable, anybody remember what a variable is from algebra? What does a variable mean? A variable is usually represented by a letter. That letter is very often x, but it doesn't have to be x. It could be y or z or a or really anything. And you use it in place of a number where you don't know what that number is. The simplest example of a variable x plus 3 equals 7. I don't know what x is until I solve it. Now when I solve it, obviously I see right away that x is 4. But at this point, before I solved it, I was using x in place of an unknown. That is a variable. Let's do our first homework question. I know it's very, very early in the, uh, in the, in the course to be doing homework questions, but Let's do our first one, just so that we can, uh, we can, I can show you how using a variable works. If you don't have it in front of you, I'm going to read question one for you of the homework. It says that the measure of one angle of a triangle is twice the measure of the second angle, and the measure of the third angle is 12 degrees more than the measure of the first angle. That's right. You did algebra to solve the problem, and that's exactly what you should do. Now. <coughs> so again, I'm going to read it again. I'll read it a little bit more slowly this time. The measure of one angle of a triangle, I'll write it down a little bit. So the first angle is twice the measure of the second angle. OK. The third is 12 more. than twice, than, uh, 12 more than the first. Okay. 
That's what the question, and they ask you, what is the measure of the largest angle of the triangle? Now, we, what, about, what should we do first? What's our first step? Well, how about strategy one? Remember strategy one? <coughs> yes, <laughs> strategy one is draw a picture. <coughs> Let's draw a diagram. And what's our diagram going to look like here? A triangle. Okay, let's draw a triangle. And I am going to draw a triangle. Whoops. Yikes. I was trying to use a straight edge, but all right, it's not going to be very straight, but that's okay. It doesn't it doesn't have to be artistry. It just has to actually make sense to you. Now, we're going <coughs> to let's use a variable. Let's and let's let's pick x as our variable. The first one, we'll call this the first angle, we'll call this the second angle, we'll call this the third angle. It really doesn't matter what you call it. The first is twice the second. So, how would we represent that? in terms of x. Okay, so let's call our first angle 2x. And our second angle we'll call x. Why? Because the first is twice the second. We don't know what each of them are, but we do know the relationship between them. And the relationship between them is 2x and x. And the third is 12 more than the first. So how would we represent the third angle? Not x plus 12, because our first angle is what? What did we represent? Remember, it's very important to be consistent. And we have to look at what we represented our first angle as, and we represented our first angle as 2x, exactly. So we're going to call the third angle 2x plus 12. Now, of course, there's one vital piece of information that we didn't learn yet. We're going to learn later on today or tomorrow that <coughs> you need to know in order to solve this problem. So I'll give you that piece of information. <coughs> and that is exactly the three angles of a triangle always equal up to 180 degrees. So I would write this as an, as an algebraic equation, which is our first angle, which is 2x, plus our second angle, which is x, plus our third angle, which is 2x plus 12, equals 180. And once you have this, now you have to solve like any other algebraic equation. And the way you do this is simply add 2x plus x plus 2x to combine them. And you've got 5x, there are 5x's all together, plus 12 equals 180. Hmm, okay, this is not going to come out to a whole number, but that's okay. And we've got, I'm just isolating the variable, 180, it's 168. So x, okay, is 168 divided by 5, which is um, 81.6. No, not, not 81.6. Uh, well, 160 divided, well, 150 divided by 5 is 30, 32, 33, 33.6, I believe. All right, you can do it with a calculator, but anybody want to do it with a calculator just to make sure I didn't mess it up? Anyway, uh, you wrote three different equations and solved for each angle. Well, how would you do that? How would you write three different equations? I, 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 if you wrote three different equations, then I'm not sure how that would work. Uh, I mean, listen, if you got the right answer, then whatever you did worked, but uh, if, if I, I think you'd probably have to put it all into one equation in order really, really for it to make it work. Okay, so what's our biggest angle? Well, our biggest angle is going to be 2x plus 12, right? Well, 2x plus 12 is obviously going to be bigger than 2x and then going to be bigger than x, so 2 times 33 plus, so, so 2x plus 12, which is our largest angle, is 2 times 33.6, which is... 67.2 plus 12, and that became 79.2. So our largest angle in this case is 79.2. And we again we used 
the variable in order to solve. <coughs> I know I kind of zipped through that the algebra over there. That's kind of what I'm going to do in this course. If you'd like me to go over that anything specific about what I did from an algebraic perspective, please let me know. Uh, I'm going to assume that you oh, okay because I just oh, first of all I'm going to assume that you you know have a basic working knowledge of algebra and so that you know how to solve these kinds of basic equations. 67.2 is because I made this into 2x. This was this was 2x over here, 2x plus 12. So instead of 2x, I did 2 times 33.6, and 2 times 33.6 to 6 is 67.2. Okay, and then of course, if you wanted to check to see what your answer is, make them all, put them all. Uh, let's see this. this well, this, and then add them up and see if they equal 180. Let's see, this is 79.2, so this was run x, that's 33.6, this was 2x, so that's 67.2, and if we add them all up together, well, 79.2, uh, yeah, that should work. Yeah, 180. Okay, it works. So, we know we have the correct answer. Okay. That is strategy three, using a variable. And we're going to use that lots of times whenever we don't know what the answer is. Number four, look for a pattern. This can be used when you know the, that a data is consistent throughout. Obtain the initial data and extrapolate to apply to the rest of the information. Extrapolation is obviously a word that may not be 100% familiar to you. So, for example, if I tell you, I think the question they ask in the book, the questions they ask about this are things like, how many toothpicks do you need to make uh, 100 squares? You know, if I have an infinite number of toothpicks, and I'm sitting here and I have to make 100 squares, how many toothpicks do I need? 100 squares that are attached to each other. So. Now, if I wanted to figure that out, there's no geometric or algebraic way to figure that out. But the idea is here, if I have toothpicks and I put one here, 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 etc., 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 how many do I need in order to have, in order to, to make 100 squares, how many toothpicks am I going to need? Well, how would we do this? How would you go about doing this? The only way to the, the only way to answer this question correctly is to is to use this method to look for a pattern and to extrapolate that pattern. You know, drawing the diagram. Yeah, I suppose in theory you could sit there drawing this a hundred times and actually count the number of sticks you use, but you know that's going to take too long. And if I told you a thousand, it would be even harder. If I told you a million, it would be virtually impossible. But if I told you a million and you use this method, it would be easy. So let's just figure out how many additional sticks are there necessary for each box. The first box obviously costs how many? The first box you draw, or the first box of toothpicks you make, costs four, of course. What does the second box cost? An additional three, that's right. What does the third box cost? An additional three. What does the fourth box cost? You see a pattern here? You see the first one's going to cost four, because you got that fixed cost to start it, I guess. And then each additional one is going to cost three. So how many toothpicks are going to make 101? Uh, so how many toothpicks are going to make uh, are going to make uh, 100 boxes? 301. That's right. How about a million? A million boxes. <laughs> three million and one. Is that what you wrote? <laughs> um, actually, you wrote. Uh, let's see, let me count the number of zeros. Yeah, you're right. You got three million and one. Very good. Okay, good. So three million and one, that's right. That's a pattern. And then once you take that pattern, you can extrapolate that however much you like. Sometimes, if you want to figure out what, what's going to happen when you do something a thousand times, we'll figure out what, you, what it's going to do the first three times and then extrapolate that to a thousand. As long as you can be consistent that the behavior is going to repeat itself, you can do this in infinite you know, you can expand this as much as you like. Sometimes, of course, you can't rely on that. Sometimes behavior will change as you move along. You know, you can't predict the weather that way because there are unpredictable patterns. Something geometric, you can predict a pattern. Okay.
Number five, make a table and fill in the information that you know and try to identify patterns of relationship. For example, if I am trying to figure out the relationship between the number of minutes I studied for a test and the grade I got on the test, and I figured <laughs> I did, let's say, five experiments five times, and I figured out that the first time I studied 40 minutes and I got a 75. The second time I studied 60 minutes and I got a uh, got an 80. The third time I studied 90 minutes and I got a uh, an 85. And then I studied uh, two hours and I got a uh, 88. And then the next time I studied uh, three hours and I got a 91 or so. <coughs> well, obviously there's a there's a pattern here. The more I study, the better grade I get. <laughs> that actually brings up the next point I was going to make. Not only does this illustrate a positive relationship, but it tells me something else. It also tells me something of the concept of diminishing returns. Anybody familiar with that term? Diminishing returns means that sometimes when you put in more and more effort or more and more money or more and more work, at some point you get to the point where putting in more effort or more money or more work doesn't bring you a very high return on your investment. And that's probably true for studying as well. You know, again, obviously this, this is, these are numbers I just made up out of thin air. But this tells you, number one, that the more I study, the better, I grade, a better grade I get. But also, as I get, <coughs> as I've studied more and more, I get to the point where the studying might not bring me as much return as it did previously. But again, that's, 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 that's a, a general concept called diminishing returns. But making a table can help me spot patterns, whereas just knowing the numbers offhand might not do as good a job in helping me spot those kinds of patterns. Next issue, Sol solve a simpler problem, which means that the, here the idea is to break it down. You have a complex question, break it down into a bunch of simpler questions. So this was an example that I got from the book. You have 20 people at a party. Everyone shakes everyone ha everyone's hand. How many handshakes are there all together? It's not an easy question if you think about it in the abstract. If I just ask you, close you, don't don't look at the slide. If I just ask you, how many handshakes are there all together? You got 20 people in the room. They all shake each other's hand once. Now, how many shakes are there? Not that easy to figure out, right? And if you sat there with a pen and paper and tried to draw every combination, you'd be there. You'd be there all night, and nobody would want to shake your hand because you'd be busy in the corner trying to work on this the entire party. Right. Well, that's correct. But why is that? The reason why that works, and the reason why Devor is correct, is because take person A. Take take person one. Person one can shake. Actually, that's uh, I, I, I actually made a mistake on the slide. I just realized that it's actually not 20 plus 19 plus 18 plus 17 plus 16. It's actually 19 plus 18 plus 16 plus 15 plus 14, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because how many people? How many? Right? How many shakes can the person can the first person execute? How many hands can the first person shake? 19. The first person can only shake 19, right? Right. Well, let's assume that you can shake your own hand because that would just look weird. See, now, you can't see, because even, like, of course, it, it was very intelligent of me to, I actually shook my own hand right now to demonstrate that shaking your own hand would look weird, figuring that you could all see that, you know, that you could all see that I'm shaking my hand, but, of course, I don't have the, the webcam on, so you can't see that, so I really didn't accomplish very much, did I? All right, <coughs> so there are 19. Um, so the first person can shake 19 hands. The second person can also shake 19 hands. So why am I going to put an 18 here? 
The first person I'm gonna can shake 19 hands, and the second person I'm gonna put an 18. The reason why I'm gonna put an 18 is because we already accounted for one and two shaking. One shook two already. So when two shakes one, that doesn't count. Exactly. So <coughs> for number two, you can't count the shake for number one. For number three, well you can't shake the number you can't count the number one, because he already shook it. Can't take the no, can't count the number two because that one was already shaken. Now also already shaken. Number three is herself. So there's 17 left. So it's 19 plus 18 plus 17 plus 16 plus 16 plus 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And then that's it. And the answer to the, the value of all of that is going to be 200, I believe. How did I figure that out? Did I just do that in my head? Did I just do 19 plus 18 plus 17 plus 16 plus 15 plus 14 plus 13 plus 12 plus 10, 9, 8, 10, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1 in my head, head just now? How did I figure out that it was going to be 200? Another little problem solving. Okay, I basically took the average. If you start from 1 and go up to 19, what number is smack dab in the middle? 10. 10 is smack dab in the middle. <coughs> I'm sorry, actually, there's only, nine, there's, uh, there's only 19 people. So it actually should be, this, now that I'm thinking about it, it's, on, there's only 19 results that average 10. So it's actually 190, not 200. Because the average is 10. So the average of all the values are going to be 10. And there's 19 values everything from 1 to 19. So that's 19 times 10, which is 190. So it's actually going to be 190, I believe. All right. So uh, let us now move on to strategy number 7. And strategy number 7 is to apply a formula. Sometimes somebody has already told you how to figure out what the answer is. If I ask you, what the circumference of a circle is. If I ask you what the area of a box is, there's no way you're going to figure it out by trial and error or any of, any of those other things, but you could simply apply a formula. If there is an established and correct formula, you can just apply that. Okay. Again, like I said before, don't assume that you have to try one of these strategies. Sometimes you're going to have a problem where you're going to try multiple strategies. You're going to draw a diagram. You're going to use an algebraic formula. And you're, going to, and you're going to use a variable to take the place of one of the values. So you may try three strategies or four strategies or more. But these are just some of the things that we're going to use as we move along. All right, that is chapter one. And as I mentioned before, chapter one is not, if it works 100% of the time, that's right. Like I said, I just uh, did, it, did, it, did it in a little bit of a hurry today, but thank you. I'll uh, make sure to keep that in mind. Okay, I'm going to put up chapter two. And chapter two is kind of a an introduction to the world of geometric shapes and measurements. Geometry is all about figures and shapes and the numerical relationships of the physical world. We're going to learn about many different types of objects in one dimension, two dimension, and three dimensions. What do I mean by a dimension, by the way? A dimension means something that is capable of physical measurement. Length, for example, is a dimension. It can measure length. It could be one foot, it could be two foot, it could be three feet, it could be four feet, whatever it is. That's a dimension. A geometric figure could be three dimensions, which is length, width, and height. A solid 
we are in three dimensions. We live in three dimensions. When you pick up something, it is a three-dimensional object. It, there could be a two-dimensional geometric figure. What's an example of something that's two-dimensional? It has only length and width, but doesn't have thickness. OK, a paper. Now, paper has a little bit of thickness, but let's say a drawing that you draw on paper. Even that has a tiny little bit of thickness in the ink, but it's representing like a square. A square is a two-dimensional object. A circle is a two-dimensional object. Mm -hmm. You could have one dimension, which is basically a line or a line segment, or you could even have a geometric figure in zero dimensions that has no length, no width, no height, no thickness, nothing. And that is simply a point. And we're going to learn about all of them. Before I start, has anybody ever read a book called Flatland? A Romance of Many Dimensions? I am going to give you a link over here. It's a short, it's a, it's a, uh, where is it? No, I'm, uh, I actually got it on my, here, I'm just trying to find the PDF. I'm sure, I'm sure it's free in many places. Okay, and no, 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 not that. All right. Anyway, the, it's an, it's a very interesting book. I, th ah, never mind. I can't find it. You can Google it somewhere. I'm sure it's it's definitely available on Kindle. I think it's it should be free in many places. Um, it's a relatively short book. It's kind of a novella. It's it's a little bit of a political commentary, but it's about a two-dimensional world. A two-dimensional world where everybody in the world is is two-dimensional. And there are squares, and there are circles, and there are triangles, and there are uh, all different types of, of shapes. And they walk, and they they walk around on paper. They walk around in two dimensions, and they're sitting there and they're talking, and they they just have their normal world, their normal political world, whatever it is. And they explain how uh, how they you know they call it's called flatland, flatland because everything is totally flat. And while they're in Flatland, they visit they visit Lineland. You see, in Flatland, which is kind of like which is on a paper, things can move around. In Lineland, which is only one dimension, nothing can ever pass anything else. Do you see why? Think of, think about. Uh, let me draw. Let me draw this here. I'll try to. I have to draw a straight line. Imagine in Flatland things. If I had a piece of paper, imagine if I had a world over here. Well, things could move around. If there was a circle here and a square here, the circle could move around the square, and the square, could, you know, the circle could move behind the square. They could feel each other, whatever it is. You know, they had sight, but uh, they can only see in one dimension, so you can't really see very much. But they use their sense of feel to get around it. Imagine. Then they also visit this thing called Lineland, which is just a line. Which is just the whole the whole universe is just one long line, and in this world, you can never pass anything else. So, for example, if one uh, being is over here, the blue one, and one being is over here, the purple one, and then you had let's say a third one. The green one over here. Do you see why, in this kind of a universe, the blue one can never come in contact with the green one? Because none of them can leave their line. None of them. The whole the whole universe is the line. So nothing can ever. So they. So in that universe, they use sound as their as their means of communication and their means of of knowing uh, of knowing things and talking. You know, talking to people and everything. They use sound, but they realize that they can never ever. Uh, you know, that one can never get one thing can never get past anything anything else. Then at one point, <coughs> at one point they go to the they 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 visit Pointland. Pointland is is something where there are no dimensions, where there's just a point. 
And the point thinks that it's the entire universe. The point thinks that it's the king of the entire universe because there's nothing else there. And then, then you know, the characters in the in the story start talking to the point, and the point thinks that it's its own imagination. Like the point thinks, "Wow, I have such a great imagination." Like someone says, uh, "Mr. Point, you realize that there are an infinite number of points around you; you just can't see them and hear them." And the point says to itself, "Ha ha! I'm so funny. I'm I. My imagination is so good. My imagination is is imagining other things talking to me and and telling me that there are other points in the universe. But of course, that's so silly, uh, because I'm because the, the the idea is that there's only one point. That's the entire universe. That's that's a zero dimensional world. And then as the story goes along." Uh, late in the story, as the, the, the square, who's kind of the hero of the story, gets visited by a sphere, a three-dimensional object, from, you know, coming down from the third dimension. And the sphere works really hard to convince the, the square, you know, the ball con- works really hard to convince the square that there's another dimension. You can just come off the flatland and go into, you know, go into, go up or down and come off of the entire flatland plane. And of course, first the square thinks that's completely ridiculous, and then, and and but then eventually the circle, fi- the the sphere, the three-dimensional sphere, finally convinces the convinces the flatlander that there's actually a third dimension. And so then the the uh, the square asks the sphere, the three-dimensional object, says, "Well, where's the fourth dimension?" And the sphere says, "Well, that's completely ridiculous. There is no fourth dimension." And the square says, well, how do you know there's no fourth dimension? Just like I always thought there were only two dimensions, and now you're showing me a third one. H- how do you know that some giant, some something from the fourth dimension is not going to come down and enter your dimension just like you entered mine? And the sphere says, oh, that's completely ridiculous. There can't possibly be a fourth dimension. Well, obviously, no. That, that, I mean, the, obviously it was an irony, but it's the idea is that... <laughs> you know, we don't know if there's a fourth dimension. There are, well, I mean, if scientifically there are four. There are. Uh, I've once read. I think there are at least ten dimensions, maybe even eleven dimensions. But they're completely blind to us. Like we cannot possibly uh, move into any any dimension beyond the three dimensions that we live in. Could there are there higher dimensions that that we could theoretically move into? You know, maybe. Who knows? We're just incapable. Our our mind is incapable of uh, of of processing that sort of thing anyway. So anyway, so that, that's the idea of, of these various dimensions. And I think keeping that in mind will help with this next, with this next thing that we're going to discuss. OK. First of all, some things about geometric rules. There are two types of rules that we're going to discuss that are going to be, uh, that are going to help us throughout our dealing with these figures. First thing is a postulate. A postulate <coughs> is something that is assumed true because it's self-evident. One example of a postulate is, some, is something is equal to itself. Now you may think, well, why on earth do you have to tell do you have to tell me that something is equal to itself? Later on, as we try to prove shapes are equal to each other, one thing that is helpful is to establish that something is equal to itself. A postulate is something that's self-evident, and therefore we could assume that it's true. A theorem, on the other hand, is true because it's been proven to be true. It may not be obvious, but some mathematician has worked up a logical or mathematical proof that it's true. The Pythagorean theorem, is something we're going to learn about next week, is the idea that in a right triangle, you know, the legs squared equals added to each other equals the hypotenuse squared. That's an example of a theorem. It's not obvious. It's not something we would know in somebody figured it out, but because somebody figured it out and it's been proven to be true, we now establish it as being true. An undefined term is something that can be described but cannot precisely be defined. For example, a point. A point is a spot in space with no length or width. Does anybody see the point on this slide? Let me make the slide a little bigger for you. Does anybody see the point? It's a tiny little point. I specifically made it as small as I could while still being visible. It's right over there. And the reason why I made the point so small is because I wanted to demonstrate the idea that a point theoretically has no dimension. Now, my point that I have over there, does that have dimensions? 
Yeah, it does, because or else you wouldn't be able to see it. But a point in and of itself, and you have to when you're drawing it with human, because the human eye can only see something if it has dimensions. So that, that my point over there does have length and width, but theoretically a point is just one particular place in space. A line is a series of points with an infinite length in both directions with no width. A line goes back and forth, and those arrows indicate that they go forever. You could have something called a line segment, which is part of a line, but theoretically a line goes forever. So people speak a little bit imprecisely when they say, I drew a line. Nobody ever, in the history of the world, nobody ever drew a line. In fact, in the history of the world, nobody has ever or will ever draw a line. It's not physically possible to draw, to draw a complete line, because drawing a complete line is going in, infinite in both directions. And it's impossible for anybody to actually do anything to the extent of infinity anyway. So, but a line is a series of points that go in each direction forever. A plane is a two-dimensional field of points, like this square that I drew you over here. The Let me put this back over here. I don't think we need such big slides. I also may need the whiteboard. So the plane is a is li like this square that I that I have over here for you. It's two dimensional. Does a plane have to be a square? No. Could be a rectangle or a circle or you know just some any any shape. It doesn't really matter. A plane just means something that it's flat, that only has two dimensions. The Flatlanders lived on a plane. A big plane, probably, but a plane nonetheless. They actually made a movie out of Flatland, I think. If you don't want to read the book, I have, now I have to find it for you. <coughs> a, a pure plane does. That's correct. A pure plane goes infinitely. But I, like a, I guess what I, what I referred to was a plane segment. Here, here's, here's, here's Flatland. Uh, whoops. Okay. Anyway, that's a commercial for Outback Steakhouse. But anyway, here is a uh, the movie Flatland. If you want to watch the movie. Anyway, space is really a three-dimensional plane. Everything in all directions. Couple. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, a point in line postulates. Here are some postulates. These are again, these are things that are fairly self-explanatory. Every line contains at least two distinct points. Really, every line segment, not just of course a line. A line contains an infinite number of points, but every line segment contains at least two points. If I have a line that's flat, and again this line is not flat, but pretend it is flat, if it were flat, it would have, it have to have at least two points in order to have any kind of width, in order to have any kind of dimensions. Two points are contained in only one line. Any two points. I could draw any two points at all, and they would only be on one line. These two points, one over here and one over here, there's only one possible line that could connect them. And that, of course, is the line that goes through both points. And again, not drawn very well, but hopefully you get the idea. This is the only line that will go through both points. If two points are on a plane, then the line connecting them is also on the same plane. Plane means like a piece of paper. If I draw two on the same piece of paper, well, then the line that connects them also has to be on that piece of paper. It can't be at a different angle. Each plane contains at least three points not on the same line because a plane has to have two dimensions. It has to have length and width. Okay. Some other important points that we're going to discuss also include a ray. A ray is a line with only one endpoint. Remember, a line goes in both directions infinitely. A ray has an endpoint, has one endpoint, and it goes infinitely in this direction. 
<coughs> a line segment has two endpoints, like the one on the slides. Let's say there's point A here and point B here, so this would be line segment AB. By the way, lines and line segments are named by any two points on them. So for example, let's say you have point C here and point D here. So if I wanted to write what this segment, this line is called, it would be called line CD. I'd put a CD with a little line and two arrows on top of it. <coughs> a ray is named for the endpoint and one other point. So for example, let's say I have point E, which is at the end over here, and then I have point F and point G, let's say. So really I could call this ray EF, or I could call it ray EG. Either one would be correct. Or if I wanted to, I could call it ray EFG. Either way, I am I'm describing the same thing. I'm describing the first thing is the end point, or the starting point, depending on which way you look at it. And the other one is another point on the line. That is the difference between a ray, a segment, and a line. Congruent, or congruent, is a term that we're going to learn a lot about later on when we talk about polygons and shapes. And that means two things that are precisely the same. In shape parlance, it means that one fits on top of the other. So if I've got, let's say, two triangles, and again, they're not, oh, I, I know what I can do. I can just, can I just copy one, one to another? One second. Nag. All right, it's not letting me copy. I thought I thought you could copy and paste here, but I guess you can't. Anyway, so <laughs> let's just say, for argument's sake, that these two these two triangles would be congruent. That means if you took one and you put it on top of the other, it would fit precisely. Later on in the course, we're going to discuss how you know whether two congruent whether two triangles are congruent. An angle is when two lines or segments or rays meet. Let's say I've got two line segments. Let's say this is point A. Let's say this is point B. And this is point C. So this distance or this space between the segments, that is what is called an angle. The way you would name the angle is to put the end point in the middle and points on either line at the end. So this angle over here would be called angle, that's the angle sig signal, BAC. Or I could also call it angle CAB. Either one is correct, but the A has to be in the middle. The measure angle, measure of an angle, which we discussed a little bit earlier when we discussed that triangle, Angle where they have to equal the three angles in a triangle have to equal 360 altogether. Well, <coughs> an angle has to be measured. What is the maximum? What is the total amount? Not 180. You can actually have angles that are bigger than 180. What's the maximum you can have for an angle? It's actually 360 because there are 360 degrees in a circle. Let's say we've got two angles. So a circle has 360 degrees together. Of that 360, there has to be some part of it taken up by the angle. Now this angle, angle A over here, angle BAC over here, is probably something like 40 degrees, give or take. I'm going to give you some angles. Oh, OK. Uh, I'm going to give you some angles. I want you to tell me approximately what the number of degrees in the angle are. Let's say this angle. OK, a little more than 60, probably about 70 degrees. That's right. OK, how about this? What kind of an angle is this? This is what is known as a right angle, or a 90 degree angle. This thing down here, 
This is called an acute angle. Acute means sharp. And it's kind of like a sharp angle. It's less than 90 degrees. Anything less than 90 degrees is an acute angle. A 90 degree angle, which is one quarter of a circle, this is called a 90 degree angle or a right angle. That's the symbol for right angle, this thing over here. Also, I want, to, I want to introduce to you another thing. Let's say this is A and this is B and that's C. So this, of course, is angle ABC. This, the, the word, there's also another word here that I want you to know, and that is the word perpendicular. Perpendicular means when two, two uh, segments or two lines meet at a right angle. So what I would say here is that segment AB is perpendicular, that's the symbol for perpendicular, to BC. So when I tell you that AB is perpendicular to BC, that means AB and BC are meet at a 90 degree angle. It doesn't have to be a segment, it could be two lines. If I have two lines, if they meet at a right angle, let's say this is AB and this is CD, if I tell you that line AB is perpendicular to line CD, that means that this is a right angle. Which means all these angles, by the way. This is 90, that's 90, that's 90, and that's 90. And we'll see why later on, but essentially there are all 90 degree angles over here. Sure. I'll do that in a minute. Let's just do, let's just do them in order. Obtuse is something bigger than a 90 degree angle, something like this. This is probably about 120 degrees. So it's bigger than a, than a bigger than a right angle. A straight angle, let's say this is point A, this is B, and this is C. Well, it's a line or a line segment, but it's also an angle. This is a semicircle. And therefore that's 180 degrees. A straight really a straight angle, you can't even see a straight angle. And then you have a reflex angle, which is something like this, assuming you're looking at this angle. Now, of course, it also has, an, uh, let's say, an obtuse angle on the other side. But this angle here, the one with the circle, this would be a reflex angle. This would be probably about a, you know, a 210 degree angle or so, maybe more. <coughs> because it's, it's like a reflex bend over backwards to get it straight. <coughs> All right, complementary and supplementary I think we'll hold over to next time. Next time we'll discuss more about different types of angles and then we're going to get into polygons and parallelograms and all that other wonderful stuff. But in the meantime, I don't have a quiz or anything for today's class, so you know just attendance will give you will will uh, be sufficient for interaction credits. Uh, and that's that's pretty much all that I we have time for today. We are going to pick up the pick this up again on Wednesday, same time, seven o'clock Eastern. I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope everybody will join us as we move along for every class. If you can, obviously, if you can't, that's okay. But if you can, that would be fantastic. If everybody could please join us. If you're listening to the recording and you're not able to join us today, but you are able to join us on other days, that would be fantastic as well. Please stick around if you have any questions and have a good evening, everybody. other days, that would be fantastic as well. Please stick around if you have any questions, and have a good evening, everybody.